Okay. Okay. So uh, the talk is on efficient an efficient fully homomorphic encryption scheme from arbitrary lattices, and this is joint work with uh, Svika Brakarski, who is a graduate student at Weizmann and MIT. The, the, the problem that we are concerned with today is the question of outsourcing computation. Um, imagine that there is um, a computationally weak device um, um, denoted by the, the mobile phone here, um, which has an input x and it wants to compute some function f on the input x. Okay? Now, uh, the thing is this computation is, uh, is very expensive and the smartphone doesn't have the resources to do the computation itself. So what it wants to do is it wants to outsource the computation to, um, to a powerful server. Okay. So um, where does this kind of uh, situation come up? This kind of scenario comes up really everywhere. Okay. Whenever you use uh, Gmail um, you know, to store your email, you know, search the email that you have stored over there, you use Google Docs, you use cloud computing, that is a canonical um, uh, scenario where uh, and this kind of situation comes up, right? So really, it, it is it is it is everywhere. Okay. For example, uh, you know, if you want to do a Google search, uh, your search query is your input. Uh, you send it over uh, to Google, uh, who uh, which does um, a search on the internet database. And it gives you the answers. This is uh, I mean I'll get into trouble for saying Google. So here you go. Um, Okay, so it's index, get f of x. Okay, so that's what happens. And now, you know, as cryptographers, you know, uh, the, the concern that's on top of our heads is privacy. And so, for example, what if my Google query is, uh, is embarrassing? What if I'm, you know, searching for my own name 20 times a day, right? So that's, that's not the kind of information that I want everyone to know. Okay, in that case, in, in these scenarios, I want the privacy of my input. I don't want to reveal my input to the server, but I want, I want to sort of keep it to myself as much as possible. <coughs> okay, a little more serious example is, uh, is if I uh, have uh, my medical records. I want to send it to the server, uh, which then performs a complex analysis on this uh, records and uh, tells me, you know, will I have a heart attack in the next year or not? Yeah, what is the probability that this happens? Okay. Um, Medical records is a, is a very private information. This is not the kind of information that you want to, you know, put out publicly on the cloud, right? Bottom line: in all these scenarios, you want you want um, two opposing um, uh, features of the system. One, I want the server to perform some computation on my input. On the other hand, I don't want to give the server my input. I want privacy of my input. Right? So these are inherently at odds with each other. But that's the situation that we run into all the time when you try to outsource computation. Okay. So in other words, what we want to do is we want to outsource computation privately, keeping my data pr as private as possible. And again, as cryptographers, you know, how do you achieve privacy of your data? We know uh, a very good, uh, you know, time-tested way of achieving privacy, which is to encrypt my data. How do you keep your data private? You encrypt it. Okay, that's what we do. So you encrypt your input, send it to the server, and now the server is in a little bit of a trouble, right? The server wants to compute a function on the input, but it simply doesn't see the input at all because all you send them is the encrypted input, which looks like complete junk to it. Okay, so. The server doesn't see uh, the input, and yet it wants to compute a function on the input. How is that possible? Right? Um, in other words, I want uh, the server to compute uh, a string y, which it sends back uh, to the client, and when the client decrypts it, it should get that back. So this is the kind of uh, uh, procedure that I want. Okay? In other words, we want a magic algorithm called a val, which takes an encryption of x, and a function, it could be any function that you want, and it computes an encryption of f of x. So the server gets to see nothing. It doesn't get to see x, it doesn't get to see the intermediate results, it doesn't get to see f of x, in nothing. All it gets is uh, encryption of f of x. And then it sends it back, and uh, the client decrypts it, and gets the result. Okay? So this is the kind of uh, thing that we want to do, and an encryption scheme, 
which comes with this magic eval uh, procedure is called a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Okay, this is exactly a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. This notion was defined very early in the history of cryptography uh, by Rivest, Adelman, and Tedros, right in 1978, a couple of years after our say was invented. But the thing is, they didn't have a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. They just said, you know, if there is a world in which there is a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, look at all the magical things that I can do. But they didn't have such a scheme. Okay, so uh, a little bit uh, more uh, specifics about what the scheme looks like, uh, you know, how this outsourcing computation proceeds. Uh, the client is now going to generate a secret key and public key. It is going to encrypt. Uh, so, uh, for for the purposes of this talk. I'm not going to talk about public key systems. I'm only going to talk about secret key systems, which is okay in this case because the person who encrypts and the person who decrypts is really the same thing. It's the client that does both. So that's uh, talking about secret key systems is fine for this uh, for, this, uh, for the purpose of uh, outsourcing competition. Okay. So a secret key. Okay. So the client generates a secret key. It encrypts uh, X using the secret key, sends it over to the uh, to the server. It also sends this special evaluation key. Okay, think of it as a, a kind of a public key that helps you evaluate uh, um, functions on the encrypted data. You send that over to the server as well. What the server does is it uses the encryption of X together with the evaluation key to compute an encryption of F of X. Okay, so there's Y, which is computed using F, an encryption of X with the help of eval, gives you is really an encryption of F of X. You send it back. When the, the correctness guarantee is that when the mobile phone decrypts uh, this cipher text, it gets f of x, what it's supposed to get. Okay. What do you need from security? Well, let's think about it. Who, who, are, we, who are we trying to protect against? I mean, wh wh who's our adversary here? It's the server. The server is that, you, that we want to protect our data against. What does the server see? The server sees an evaluation key, and it sees an encryption of x. And the uh, security requirement is that given all this information, the encryption of X should look like the encryption of zero. I mean, so it should reveal no information about X at all. Okay? Uh, and this is really uh, the standard notion of uh, security of encryption schemes, namely in CPA security or semantic security, you know, your favorite name for it. Right? So this is what uh, the syntax of a fully homomorphic encryption schemes and what and the security and correctness guarantees that we want from the scheme. Okay, so what is uh, what is fully about a fully homomorphic encryption scheme? Homomorphic encryption scheme you understand, right? I mean, you, you know, get encryption of X, you compute encryption of F of X. What is fully about this scheme? Fully means that you can evaluate all efficient functions on the encryption of X. Okay? No matter what computation you want to do on the clear data, data in the clear, you can do it on the encryption of that data. Okay, so that's what a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Is. Okay, that's what we are going to uh, construct. So how do we how do we go about constructing a fully homomorphic encryption scheme? I mean, it seems like a complicated problem, right? You, you want to compute any efficient function, anything that you can imagine doing inside the encrypted data. That sounds like a terribly complicated problem. Uh, what the first thing we want to do is uh, is really the first thing we learn in a computer science 101 class. Right? What do we learn? You have a complicated problem, we break it down into simpler problems. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And the main observation is that to compute an arbitrary function, it is enough to compute additions and multiplications on data. In other words, uh, the addition and multiplication gates, which over GF2, is really XOR and AND gates, forms a universal set. Okay? So no matter what computation you want to do, you can write down as a, as a Boolean circuit with uh, XOR and AND gates. Okay? So that's the first observation. What does this mean for us? Well, what it says is that if you have a method to add encrypted uh, bits, encrypted x1, encrypted x2, I compute encrypted x1 plus x2, and the same with multiplication, then I can compute any Boolean function on encrypted data. Okay, encrypted x1, you go level by level, you compute the gates, you get the output. Okay, that's what, uh, so then we are done. So can we do it, right? I mean, can we compute additions and multiplications on encrypted data? 
what we know so far are partial solutions to this problem. But uh, right from the work of Professor Nicoli in, uh, in 1982, uh, we knew encryption scheme which can uh, add encrypted bits, but not multiply. Then we knew schemes which can multiply encrypted numbers, but not add. And uh, then, very recently, uh, we, we know of uh, schemes which can do uh, many additions, as many additions as you want, but only one multiplication. Okay? So this is from the work of uh, Bonego and uh, Nesin. And then you can do additions and multiplications, but the length of the ciphertext becomes bigger and bigger. Okay? So this is not useful for us in the context of outsourcing computation, because I want to send a small ciphertext, and I want to get a small ciphertext. It's not OK for me if the ciphertext size increases uh, beyond control. Okay? So that's not good for us. What we really want is an encryption scheme, which can do uh, many additions, many multiplications, as many as you want, really, uh, where the ciphertext stays the same. Okay, the length of the ciphertext stays the same. Okay, that's what we want. Okay, this was really uh, a big open question, really uh, cryptography's holy grail for 30 years, from the time it was proposed until Gentry's uh, breakthrough work in uh, 2009, where he constructed the first candidate fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Okay, the main sort of contribution, um, sort of uh, a technical contribution in, uh, in Jeffrey's uh, work is what he calls the, the bootstrapping theorem. Okay? So what does the bootstrapping theorem say? Well, it says that to construct a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, one that can evaluate arbitrary functions, it's enough to construct a homomorphic encryption scheme which can evaluate deep enough Boolean circuits. Okay? In other words, what it says is that if you can uh, evaluate deep enough Boolean circuits, then you can really go all the way to arbitrary depth. Okay, so that's the, the remarkable theorem. Um, I'm probably not doing justice to the theorem by just telling you the statement, but the proof is amazingly remarkable. Okay, and let me be a little more uh, uh, sort of precise about this theorem. So what does deep enough mean? Right? So what, is, what does it mean precisely? It means uh, deeper than the decryption circuit of the scheme itself. Okay? So if you can evaluate all functions that are deeper than its own decryption circuit. So it's kind of a self-referential thing, right? So I want to evaluate my own decryption circuit. That's why would you want to do that, right? But what he says is that if you can do that, then you can construct, then you can evaluate anything you want. And that's the that's the bootstrapping. Okay, bit more precise. And he says that if you have the homomorphic encryption scheme that computes depth D circuits such that the uh, encryption scheme has decryption depth less than D, okay, so the decryption depth is less than the depth you can evaluate, that gives you a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Okay, that's what, uh, that's what uh, the theorem says. And there is a little star there which you're not supposed to see uh, unless you have great eyesight, and I'll get to that in uh, the end of the talk. Okay, so uh, given the bootstrapping term, here is how Gentry's work, uh, Gentry's construction is. Okay, it really proceeds in two steps. One, he constructs uh, a dehomomorphic encryption scheme, one that can compute depth to D circuits. But unfortunately, the decryption circuit of the scheme has depth bigger than D. Okay, so why? Who knows, right? It's a law of nature, right? Uh, and the result is that you cannot take the scheme and apply a bootstrapping theorem to get a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, because the decryption depth is too large. Okay. So that, uh, his construction is based on the assumption that um, uh, it's hard to find sharp vectors in ideal lattices. Okay. So I'll say what these things are in a bit. I mean, we saw this uh, in the last uh, two days very extensively, but I'll, I'll repeat this uh, a little bit later. And this really leads to what I would call the sharp blanket syndrome. Okay. So you can evaluate, you have a blanket of a certain length, okay. you can evaluate a certain depth, but your decryption depth is longer, your lead goes you know, out of the blanket. So that's always the case. You can evaluate any depth, but your decryption depth is larger than, uh, than the depth you can evaluate. Okay? So this, you know, by itself, doesn't suffice for us. Okay. okay, so what is the next step? You want to take the same encryption scheme, and you want to squash the decryption circuit, so, you know, decrease the decryption depth of the circuit, just smaller than D. 
Okay. Once you do that, uh, you want to do this while keeping the evaluation uh, complexity the same. You want to still evaluate depth D circuits, but you want to squash the decryption uh, circuit to have depth less than D. Okay. So once you do that, you have an encryption scheme uh, which can evaluate depth D circuit with decryption depth less than D. Now you apply the bootstrapping theorem. You're gold. Okay, you're done. Okay. The thing is, in the process of uh, squashing the decryption uh, uh, circuit, Jenkins needs to make an additional assumption. Okay. So the original assumption was that it's hard to approximate short vectors in ideal lenses. He needs to make an additional assumption which says that the sparse subset sum problem is hard. Okay, I'll say what this is in a minute. Okay, so two assumptions. The bottom line is that there are two cryptographic assumptions, and with this I get a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Okay. Since uh, Jedrick's work, uh, we have seen a number of additional candidate fully homomorphic encryption schemes. Uh, the first uh, in joint work with uh, Martin Mandek, Jedrick, and Halaby which uh, it relies on the hardness of uh, what's called the approximate GCD problem. GCD is the greatest common, approximate greatest common divisors problem. Plus the same sparse subset sum. So we run into the same sort of short blanket syndrome. And to solve it, you know, we use the uh, squashing paradigm. And uh, therefore, we have to zoom the hardness of sparse subset sum. Okay. Earlier this year, uh, together with Zvika, uh, we um, uh, came up with another scheme based on what's called the ring of the assumption. Uh, but again, you know, it's a, as if by a strange law of nature, it again runs into this short blanket uh, problem. And to solve it, we use the same uh, sparse subset sum assumption. Or we have another approach that uh, where you can dispense with these two assumptions, it, you, you can just make one assumption, which is the sparse ring LW assumption. Okay. But the point is that, but the point is that these are all new assumptions. You know, these are you know, assumptions that you just made up. You came up with the construction and said, well, what is the assumption that I can prove this under? There you go. Right? So these are not very well-studied assumptions. And what we would like to do is uh, base fully homomorphic encryption on a standard you know, well-studied assumption. That's what we do. Okay, again, uh, these are uh, new schemes. There are also efficiency improvements um, of Jetri scheme and also uh, implementations, uh, concrete implementations of Jetri scheme. Uh, by Smart and Bercaltran and uh, Jandri and Halaby and a couple of others. Still in circle. Okay, so this is what uh, this is what uh, you know the world now looks like. The question is, are we done? I mean, it seems like there are you know three schemes. What more could you ask for, right? Uh, and three fully homomorphic encryption schemes. Obviously, you know, I shouldn't be asking this question. This is really a rhetorical question. I don't expect you to answer it. Uh, no. I mean, the answer is, uh, you know, we are not, uh, we're not, uh, we're not done. In fact, there are many questions that are open um, uh, post uh, Gentry's work. Okay. The first question is, uh, can you base uh, the security of these schemes on the hardness of uh, problems on arbitrary lattices? Okay. So what is the lattice? We saw this uh, yesterday, you know, it's a lattice, there are short vector problems. And the short vector problem is a fundamental algorithmic problem. It's not useful just in cryptography. Um, you know, it has been studied in the context of algorithms, you know, optimization, and so forth. You know, it was even used in, uh, in the previous talk uh, in the form of LL, LL algorithm. Okay, so this is a very so fundamental algorithmic, algorithmic problem. It's been very well studied. And we know that in high dimensions, uh, this problem is hard to solve. Okay, even, find an approximate, even finding an approximate short vector is actually hard. It's believed to be hard. Okay. On the other hand, this is not the assumption that uh, Gentry's work relies on. The assumption that his work relies on is the hardness of finding sharp vectors in ideal lattices. Okay. Now, what is an ideal lattice? An ideal lattice is a lattice, as before, but the points have an additional structure. Okay. Uh, the structure is that if you uh, look at a point, 2 comma 3, and interpret it as a polynomial, namely 2x plus 3, any sort of if you, if you multiply this polynomial by any other polynomial, any polynomial that you want, you will get another point in the same lattice. So that's an ideal, right? So it, it corresponds to an ideal uh, in a number field. Okay. So you take 2x plus 3, multiply it by x, reduce it modulo x squared minus 1, you get 3x plus 2, which is also a point in the lattice. Okay. So it's, there's a lattice with a very special multiplicative structure. Okay. Whereas 
in a regular lattice, the only structure you have is an additive structure. I mean, a lattice is additively closed. That's the only thing we know about the lattice. Okay? And this uh, problem, uh, problems on ideal lattices, are mostly studied in, uh, in a cryptographic context. Okay? So um, they're not nearly as well studied as uh, sharp vector problems on arbitrary lattices. So bottom line, this is a useful assumption, useful to get efficiency and so on and so forth, but it's a risky assumption because we don't know. It seems like this object has so much algebraic structure that you should be able to do something with it to develop better algorithms, and yet we don't know how to do it. Right? So it seems like a risky assumption to make. So of course, this can be based uh, fully homomorphic induction on standard lattice assumptions, you know, sharp vectors in uh, arbitrary lattices. That's the kind of thing we want. Okay. Uh, the, the, the other sort of philosophical question is, to construct a fully homomorphic intuition, do you need ideal assumptions? Okay. So if you think about it, uh, to do a fully homomorphic intuition, you need to add and you need to multiply. Right? Therefore, you need a mathematical structure that supports both addition and multiplication. It seems obvious. right? And what is such a structure? Yeah, rings, are ideals, and so forth. So it seems like ideals are inherent to fully homomorphic intuition. That's the intuition. The question is, is this intuition true? Is it, is it, is it a bogus intuition or is it actually true? Right? The second question is, uh, is to uh, do away with this uh, squashing, is this funny squashing uh, business. Okay? Uh, again, the, the point is that the sparse, uh, to do squashing, you need to assume the hardness of uh, the sparse subset sum problem. I'm not going to say what it is, except that uh, it is an average case assumption a new average case assumption that it's fairly untested. And really, it, aesthetically, uh, it, is, it seems like this assumption should not be there. Okay, so it is a way to force our solution. Um, it is a way to remove this uh, short blanket problem. Why should the short blanket problem exist in the first place? We have no idea. Okay, so this seems a very artificial way of uh, you know, um, uh, constructing fully homework. One that works, actually, but uh, still not. The question is, can you do it without squashing and this additional sparse subset sum assumption? Okay, so that's, uh, that's the second question. Finally, you know, we live in the real world, right? We not uh, do cryptography, but we live in the real world. And people actually want to use these schemes. So these are not theoretical schemes. Uh, these are motivated by real practical problems, and people want to use these schemes. The problem is that in known schemes, in all the in Jordi scheme and all the subsequent works, uh, the process of generating a key and the process of uh, evaluating a function are, are, are computationally very expensive and they're exhausting. Okay, so it's not just that they are uh, expensive, they are also difficult to code up and you know it's a complicated algorithm and uh, we would like to get rid of it. We'd like to make things as simple as possible. The question is, can you implement fully homomorphic encryption in a simple, I can't overstate how important simplicity is, and also efficiency. Okay, so can you do it? Okay, so finally in this uh, star that, uh, that comes up again and again, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this, I'll postpone this to the, to the very end. Okay, so what do we show? So these are the problems in, uh, in, the, in the fully homomorphic world. What do we show? We construct a fully homomorphic encryption scheme under the assumption that it's hard to compute approximate sharp vectors in an arbitrary lattice. Okay, so we, the, our assumption is the worst case hardness of um, sharp vector problems in arbitrary lattices. Or, in other words, we can also base the security of our scheme on the learning with errors assumption, which by now is a, it's a very well studied and very standard um, assumption. That's, uh, that's, that's what we do. We don't need squashing. Uh, we directly construct uh, a dehomomorphic encryption scheme, one that, can, the one, one that can evaluate depth D circuits, which has decryption depth smaller than D. Okay, so once we do that, we can directly apply the bootstrapping theorem and get a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Okay, so no squashing. And finally, and uh, not the least, uh, we, get, uh, we get a more efficient scheme. We have uh, our scheme has very short ciphertext. And by very short, I mean that the length of the ciphertext is the same of, same as the length of the ciphertext in a non-homomorphic scheme. Okay, so take a, an encryption scheme, a lattice-based encryption scheme, which does not support any homomorphism, 
Okay, and take our scheme, they'll have the same uh, ciphertext length. Okay, can't you do much better than that? Um, it, this also means that uh, the shorter the ciphertext is, the more efficient the decryption, uh, encryption, and so on and so forth. Okay, finally, uh, the scheme is simple in the sense that uh, the key generation algorithm is, is very simple. You just generate a random vector. That's going to be the key. Okay, so this is our result. Uh, this is our main result. And we use this uh, homomorphic encryption scheme uh, to do a couple of more things. Okay, so uh, as corollaries of our main result, we, uh, the first thing we get is a fully homomorphic identity-based encryption scheme. Okay, so uh, what is an identity-based encryption? Probably most of you guys know it, but uh, let me repeat anyway. Uh, remember that, mm, remember that in a standard public encryption scheme, to encrypt um, a message to you, I need to know your public key. And where do I get your public key? It's stored in their public infrastructure somewhere. And identity-based encryption says that the only thing I need to know to encrypt a message to you is your name or your email address, which I know anyway, right, because I'm sending you a message. What we can do uh, using our main results is we can construct a fully homomorphic identity-based encryption scheme. In the sense that it's an encryption scheme uh, where uh, to encrypt a message, I just need to know the identity of the person or the email address of the person. Um, you know, all the standard features of an identity-based encryption scheme. And yet, um, if someone wants to um, uh, take encryptions uh, intended for Bob and compute a function on them, they need to know Bob's evaluation key. Okay, so uh, the point is that anyone can encrypt to Bob. But to take Bob's self attacks and process, do some processing on them, I need Bob's permission. I need Bob to give me the evaluation key. Otherwise, I can't do anything. Okay? So I, I tend to think of this as a feature rather than a, rather than a bug. Uh, our fully homomorphic encryption scheme can be used to construct what's called a private information retrieval protocol, an optimal private information retrieval protocol. Uh, PIR or private information retrieval is the problem of uh, uh, retrieving uh, an element of a database. Uh, let's say you have a database of uh, size n, n entries, and you want to retrieve the ith element of the database. Okay, so the database is stored in a server. I want to set an index, get the ith item, but I don't want the server to know what index, which item I'm searching for. Okay, so this is private uh, information retrieval. And the thing that we want to optimize is the is the, is the, is the communication complexity of this uh, of this mechanism. Okay, so I could ask the server to send the entire database to me. Okay, so that's n bits of communication, but it's pointless. Right, n is usually very very large. Think of the internet uh, database. Okay, so we want ideally we want to um, uh, run such a protocol with communication complexity logarithmic in n. Okay, so that's really the best we can do, and that's what we want to achieve. Okay, so again. Uh, the trivial uh, uh, protocol, which doesn't achieve any privacy, proceeds by you sending an index to the server. Okay, so how many bits do you need to specify the index? Log n bits. Okay, so that's the insecure protocol. And we want to construct a secure protocol with essentially the same communication complexity. Okay, that's what we want to do. The previous best schemes that did this had communication complexity log cubed n. So, uh, factor, uh, so the, um, it's far away from the uh, optimal um, scheme that we can get. And what we construct is a scheme which achieves communication close to close to log n. Okay, it's O tilde log n. O tilde means uh, sort of poly log log n factors. Because if you want to think about it, it's log n times log log n. It's very close to the optimal bound of log n. Okay, so that's what we can do uh, uh, with private information retrieval. Uh, and the way our result, uh, our main result uh, goes is uh, we, uh, we come up with uh, two new techniques uh, to construct fully homomorphic encryption. The first is uh, called relinearization. Okay, so th these are things that I will spend a lot of time on later in the talk, but I just want to give you a preview. Uh, what is relinearization? It's a mechanism that helps you construct uh, a dehomomorphic encryption scheme from the learning with errors problem, from the hardness of learning with errors. Okay. And this homomorphic encryption scheme has the feature rather the bug that uh, its evaluation depth is d, but the decryption depth is larger than d. Okay, so this is uh, you know you cannot apply the bootstrapping theorem directly to it. Okay, 
And that's where our second technique comes in, which we call the dimension uh, and modulus reduction. And this is a technique to take the scheme and reduce its decryption depth to much smaller than D, while keeping the evaluation depth to be the same, to be D itself. Okay, so once we have it, we are happy. Okay, we can take the scheme, apply a bootstrapping theorem, done. Okay, very happy. Okay, uh, and a byproduct of this uh, technique is that uh, we get an encryption scheme with very, very short side vertices. Okay, so these are the two uh, main techniques in this work. Uh, and with that, let's uh, let's jump into the so the technical part of the talk. Uh, what I will do is I'll describe the LWE assumption. I'll go over it rather quickly, given what we did the last two days. Um, I will show the relinearization technique, use it to construct a dehomorphic encryption scheme. Then I'll show the dimension reduction technique. If I have time, which looks like I will, I will show the fully homomorphic IB and the peer protocol, the, the two applications of our um, of our scheme. And I'll tell you a few words about the, the concrete efficiency of the scheme. So when you try to implement it in practice, you know, how much time does it run for? Does it run for, you know, 15 milliseconds or order of 15 milliseconds, right? I mean, that makes all the difference. Uh, I'll say a few words about it, and, uh, and that's it. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, let's jump right in. Uh, learning with errors problem, okay? Uh, the learning with errors problem uh, is, uh, it's parameterized by uh, two numbers, like we saw yesterday. It's the same problem that, uh, that we described yesterday. Uh, the two uh, numbers are uh, a dimension n and a modulus q. Okay? And the problem says, well, I'm either going to give you, um, I have a random secret in my head, and I'm going to give you uh, linear functions on the secret. Okay? I'm going to pick a random a1, and I'm going to give you this random linear combination of s plus a small error. I'm going to give you many of these guys polynomially many of these guys. The assumption is that this looks like totally random to me. Okay, same assumption that we saw yesterday. This is the decisional version of the assumption. And this assumption is, is, is a very nice assumption. It's structurally, you know, it just talks about uh, linear combinations of uh, small numbers. Okay, it's structurally a very nice assumption. Um, and it also has uh, a connection to the worst case hardness of, uh, of lattice problems, okay? In the sense that uh, we have uh, theorems of the form, uh, well, if you manage to solve the learning with errors problem, then you can find a sharp vector, in fact, many sharp vectors, uh, in an arbitrary lattice. Okay, and that is believed to be, that is a very well studied problem, it's believed to be hard, and therefore we are, we are uh, floating in space, we are happy. Okay. Um, what are the parameters that we will assume? Well, um, I'm going to assume uh, that n is, n is my security parameter. Okay, think of it as uh, 512. Okay, that's the kind of thing I'm going to talk about. Q is exponential, sub-exponential in n. Okay, it's so a 2 to the n to the epsilon. Okay, so the number of bits in Q is n to the epsilon. And the error in the RWE is uh, chosen at random from uh, minus poly n to poly n. Okay, so it's a, it has magnitude uh, polynomial in it. For these parameters, uh, the best algorithm uh, to solve uh, the learning with errors problem runs in sub-exponential time. Okay, so not far from polynomial time, we are uh, we are safe, asymptotically. Okay, so this is the hardness assumption. How do we construct an encryption scheme from LWE? Okay, so as I said before, I'm going to only talk about a symmetric encryption scheme. Getting a public encryption scheme is actually easy. It's a, it's a, there's a generic way to uh, construct a public encryption scheme um, from any secret key um, homomorphic encryption scheme. Okay? So going from secret key encryption to public encryption, that's a big, big open question in cryptography. We have no idea how to do it. But if you have a secret key homomorphic, even additively homomorphic encryption scheme, you can get a public encryption scheme with essentially the same uh, level of efficiency. Okay? No problems. Because of these reasons, I'm going to omit talking about public encryption. Let's just talk about secret key encryption schemes. How do you uh, construct such an encryption scheme? My key generation is going to sample the random uh, vector s in zq to the n, n dimensions. Each coefficient comes is random from zq. And that's my secret key. Okay, so this is, an, this is like an LWE uh, learning with error secret. That's exactly what it looks like. I'm going to show how to encrypt a bit. 
simplicity. And the way to do this is I sample a random A, exactly like in the description of LWE, and a noise E, a small noise. And my ciphertext is going to be A in a product with S, plus uh, two times an error, it's an even error, plus the message. Okay, message is a bit. So another way to think about this is that if you look at this number two times E plus N, it's a random small error whose least significant bit is the message that you encrypt. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the way to think about it. Okay, so your ciphertext is uh, a pair of uh, uh, elements, a vector A and a number B. How do you decrypt? It's very simple, very, very simple. I have the secret key and therefore I can compute B minus A in a product with S. Okay, and what is that? It's a small number whose least significant bit is the message that I'm interested in. Okay, so now I uh, take this modulo 2, I'm done. I get the message. So yes. Why are you doing the addition in integers? If you're doing it in CSFQ, I'm not. I'm doing it over CSFQ, actually. The multiplication by 2 plus integers. Q is odd. Q is odd. Q is odd. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm assuming about Q. So, so if I take uh, so if I take this mod two, I don't get anything, right? Because mod q mod two is not uh, um, mod two mod q. Yeah, that works because e is very small. E, e is very small. Yeah. Uh, you, you mean the decryption? The decryption works because e is small. Okay. So uh, b minus a in the product with s is two e plus n, which is small. Uh, so when I reduce it mod q, it doesn't change it at all. Fifteen mod seventeen is fifteen. And then I take mod 2 uh, and drop. Okay. Why is it correct? Well, I just explained this, right? Uh, I do this, I get uh, m plus 2e. And as long as the error is smaller than q over 4, there is no wraparound. And I get the message. Why is it secure? The security is really the LWE assumptions. It follows in a straightforward way from the LWE assumption. The only uh, reason why it's not completely straightforward is that there is a 2 in here. Okay, so the LWE assumption says that if I give you the inner product plus a noise, an arbitrary small noise, you don't learn the message. I'm giving you this number with an even noise. Okay? The thing is, this doesn't make it any easier because uh, two, is in, 2 is invertible mod 2. 2 and Q are relatively prime. Okay, this is where I crucially use the fact that uh, Q is odd. Okay, so this is as hard as, uh, as LWE. When I look at the ciphertext, it looks pseudo random to me. It leaves no information on the message at all. Okay, so this is a very, very simple symmetric key encryption scheme from LW. Can't think of something simpler than this. Okay, so why is this scheme? So now let's go to the juicy part, right? Why is this homomorphic? Why is this scheme homomorphic? Well, let's take two ciphertexts, an encryption of uh, a bit B and an encryption of a bit B prime. Okay, so what does an encryption look like? It looks like a comma, well, no, sorry, uh, an encryption of m and an encryption of m prime. Okay, so these are the messages that I encrypt. What do, what do these encryptions look like? They look like a comma b and a prime comma b, b prime, a vector and a number. Okay, and what is, uh, what is the property of this uh, ciphertext? If I take b minus a in a product with s, rather sum of a i times s i, I get the message plus two times an error. And the same with, uh, with a prime b prime. How do I add ciphertext? Very simple. Very, very simple. You just take the two ciphertexts and add them component-wise. Okay, so you compute uh, A plus A prime and B plus B prime, and I claim that this is actually a, a valid ciphertext, which will decrypt to the product, uh, to the sum of the two messages, mod 2. Why? Let's go over it. Uh, I have uh, one ciphertext that satisfies this equation, I have another ciphertext that satisfies this equation. Okay, two linear equations. Linear equations in the secret key, in the components of the secret key S. I just add these two equations together. What I get is another linear equation on the secret key, which evaluates uh, to the sum of the two messages, plus an even error. Okay, so once I take this guy, mod 2, I get the sum of the messages, mod 2. Okay, so ciphertext look like linear equations. And computing uh, a ciphertext that decrypts to the sum of the two messages is simply adding the linear equations together. When I add two linear equations, I get another linear equation in the secret key. 
Okay. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, the error here grows. The error becomes larger than what you had before. In fact, uh, if you had uh, E and E prime, it becomes E plus E prime. Okay. How do you decrypt? Well, I take uh, N plus. I evaluate. How do I decrypt? I evaluate this uh, linear function on the secret key. Okay. So this whole thing was a mental experiment. It says, you know, here is a uh, ciphertext that satisfies uh, linear relation when you evaluate it on the secret key, and another ciphertext. And when I add the two linear equations, I get another linear equation. Okay. My ciphertext is going to be really the sum of the two uh, vectors and the sum of these two numbers. When I decrypt it, I get the right-hand side of this linear equation. That gives me the message. Okay. OK. So that's uh, homomorphic addition. Very simple, right? No complications here. How do I multiply ciphertext? OK. Uh, a natural idea, you know, when, you, when, you, when I added ciphertext, I added the linear equations. When I multiply ciphertext, I multiply linear equations. Right? I mean, it's, uh, that's the first idea that you think of. So, OK, fine. I take uh, these two linear equations, multiply them together. What do I get? Uh, I get an expression whose right-hand side is really m times m prime, the product of the two messages, plus an even number. Because it has, it has all these four terms, and all the terms are even except for m times m prime. So right, I mean, it's uh, m times m prime uh, plus uh, an even number. That's what the right-hand side looks like. The left-hand side, what is it? It's a product of two linear equations. Okay? So the product of linear equations is not linear anymore. It's a quadratic equation. Uh, it has terms of the form. It's a constant term. It is a linear term in S and a quadratic term in, uh, in the coefficients of S. So that's what it looks like. Now that's the problem, right? Because our ciphertexts are supposed to satisfy linear relations. How do I construct uh, a ciphertext from here that satisfies a linear relation? I have no idea, right? One thing that you might think of, well, the error here uh, is, not, uh, is larger than before. Uh, but you can, it's not, it doesn't grow unbounded in an unbounded way. Okay, so the error becomes the product of the two errors that you had before. Uh, the coefficients, you have a quadratic expression whose coefficients are computable from the uh, input side of the text uh, because all of the numbers a of i, a prime of i, b and b prime are known to me. They are part of the input side of the text. Okay, so I can write down this expression the co and, the, and, and I know all the coefficients. Okay, so there is a problem here, which is that uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, equation is not linear anymore. It's a quadratic uh, equation. But can you, can you still use this quadratic equation to, uh, uh, to decrypt? I mean, is it still okay? Right? So let's, uh, let's give it a try. How about you set the ciphertext to be the coefficients of h0, the hi's, and the hij's? Okay, so I take uh, two ciphertexts, I compute these coefficients, which I can, using just a ciphertext, and I output these ciphertexts as uh, these coefficients as the uh, new ciphertext. Okay, the, the uh, ciphertext that encrypts to the product of the two messages. Okay, does it work? Well, if I have these coefficients, and I have the secret key during decryption, I'm simply going to evaluate, I can decrypt by evaluating this quadratic expression on the secret key and the product of, uh, you know, every pair of terms in the secret. So this is something that I know. When I evaluate it, I get the product of the two messages plus an even error. Therefore, I get the product of the two messages. Okay. So even though this ciphertext looks weird, it looks like uh, it, it only satisfies a quadratic function on the secret key, I can still decrypt it and compute the product of the two messages. Okay. The problem, really, is not the fact that it's a, not simply the fact that it's a quadratic ciphertext. The problem is that the ciphertext, which is all the coefficients of this quadratic expression, now contains roughly n squared elements. So the original ciphertext had n plus one elements in ZQ. Now this guy is going to contain n squared elements. Okay, so that's one, just one multiplication. I do it once more, it becomes n cubed, and it really grows exponentially in the number of multiplications I do. Okay, that's, that is the, that is the, killer problem. Okay. So the question is, uh, you know, we have taken one step, which seems to be a nice step, right? 
uh, can we take this uh, ciphertext, this large ciphertext, and find a more compact representation of this ciphertext? Because okay, so that's what uh, we want to uh, we want to solve. In fact, we can do this, and this is uh, the technique that we call relinearization. Relinearization because we take a quadratic ciphertext and convert it. We will convert it back to a linear ciphertext. Okay, so how do we do this? Uh, we uh, we want to find. We have a quadratic function on the on the secret key, right? What we want to do is we want to find a linear function of the secret key, which represents uh, this quadratic function. Okay, in some sense. In fact, what we will do is we will find a linear function of a new secret key, a new secret S prime, which represents uh, this quadratic function. That's what we'll do. Okay. A little more precisely, our new key generation algorithm will generate two vectors. S and S prime, not one as before. We're going to generate two vectors, and the secret key is going to be these uh, these two vectors. Okay. It is also the key generation algorithm is also going to generate an evaluation key. Okay, so before we didn't have an evaluation key at all; we just had a secret key. Now it's going to generate an evaluation key, which is really encryptions of the product of the uh, components of the old secret key using the new secret key. Okay, so I'm going to call S the old uh, secret key and S prime the new secret key. And this guy looks like an encryption of this as the message. This is the quadratic function using uh, the new secret key. And I'm also going to encrypt uh, linear functions of uh, the new secret key using the old secret key. Okay, so I have many ciphertexts here, n squared, order of n squared ciphertexts. And I'm going to publish all these guys in the, in the evaluation key. Okay, so this is up in the sky, everyone can see it, no problems. Okay, so why is this? Why is it okay to publish these guys? Well, because of the beauty. Okay, so these these uh, evaluation these elements in the evaluation key are encryptions, uh, LWV encryptions of one secret key using another secret key, and uh, because of the beauty is hard, these ciphertexts look like random elements to me. Okay, so it's okay to publish this. It doesn't harm your security to publish these uh, elements in the evaluation key. Okay, that's great. Why does it help? Like, right? what is uh, you know what is the point of publishing this evaluation key? The point, the crucial point, is that once you have these ciphertexts, these ciphertexts give you a way of writing these quadratic functions, the quadratic monomials in the secret key as a linear function of the new secret key. Okay, so if you look at this uh, bij, it, is really, it really gives you, it gives you an equation, which is that s of i times s of j is roughly bij minus the inner product of aij times s prime. So this is a linear function of the new secret key. This is not an equality, it's only an approximate uh, equality because of this error. Okay, so I transfer, transform a quadratic monomial into an approximate linear function of a new secret key. Okay, that's what we do. Okay, so how does it help? Um, I am going to take this expression. Let me do this mental experiment. Okay, I am. Let me take this uh, expression and let me plug it in back into this uh, original expression that we got by simply multiplying the two linear equations. Okay, so what do I get? I have another way to write this i times this j here, which is a linear function of. Um, S prime. Another way of writing S, S of i, which is a linear function in S prime. Linear function plus linear function, linear function. Okay, this whole thing is a linear function of the new secret key S prime, which evaluates to the product of the two messages. Okay, so that looks like that now looks like a properly formed kosher ciphertext of uh, uh, the product of the two messages. Okay, so that's the technique. That's the main uh, technique, uh, the first main technique in this work. Let's let's look at it uh, a bit more closely. And uh, what we are going to do is we are going to take uh, a, a two ciphertexts as before. This is supposed to be here. I'm going to compute the coefficients of this uh, quadratic expression, which I can from the ciphertext. I'm going to construct uh, a new ciphertext, A malt, comma B malt, which is essentially grouping together, the A malt is really grouping together the, const, uh, the coefficients of S prime in this expression 
and B1 is grouping together the constant terms, right? So H0, HIBI, and HIJBIJ, these are all constant terms. And these are terms that get multiplied by the new secret key, S prime. Okay, so I'm going to group these two things together, and I'll call that my new ciphertext. Okay, why is that uh, a good ciphertext? Right? If I get a ciphertext, I'm going to use the new secret key to uh, decrypt, and I compute this guy. And this, it seems like a complex expression, but really it evaluates um, to uh, this expression out here um, in to at all. Okay? And that is really the product of the two messages. Okay? Uh, so this, uh, it's a proper, what I constructed is a proper encryption of the product of the two messages. And we did just one multiplication. During using this process, okay, uh, that's not it. We want to do more multiplications, as many as we want, really. Uh, and the way to do it is to uh, uh, add new secret keys every time, right? Not just S and S prime, but S S prime, S double prime, so on and so forth. And in the evaluation key, I'm going to encrypt. I'm going to publish an encryption of quadratic terms in S using S prime. Uh, quadratic terms in S prime using S double prime, so a chain of encryptions, right? So that's what I'm going to publish. And what I do is, when I do one multiplication, I'm going to get a ciphertext which is encrypted under S prime. One more multiplication I get, I go to S double prime, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, I can do as many multiplications as I want. If you give me an a priori number, you want to say, okay, I want to do 100 multiplications, I will show you how to do 100 multiplications. Okay. The limiting factor, really, in this, uh, this process is, that, is the fact that uh, the error in the ciphertext blows up. Okay. Um, so how much does the... So remember, in this equation that we wrote down before... Uh, well, in this equation for multiplication that we uh, uh, wrote down before, the error is really the product of the two original errors. Okay? So when I add two ciphertexts, the error adds up. When I multiply two ciphertexts, the error more or less multiplies. There are more terms, but they are linear terms, so they are small compared to the product. And this is really a problem. Okay? This is a huge problem. What this means for us is that, uh, is that this king can only compute uh, a Boolean circuits with the depth at most uh, epsilon times log n. Okay, epsilon times log n is really uh, log log q. So remember that our q is two to the end to the epsilon. This number is really log of log of q. Okay, so that's epsilon log. N. That's how we get this number. Okay, so uh, so this is the best we can do with our scheme, and that's uh, we're not happy with that. We want to do. We want to do a lot of multiplications. Okay. So uh, put it together. What we have is uh, this is our scheme uh, of key generation samples uh, D secret keys. If you want to do D multiplications, publishes all this chain of encryptions. When I encrypt, I'm going to encrypt using the first secret key in this chain. And whenever I do an evaluation, I keep sort of moving up the chain, so to speak. And when I decrypt, I'm going to decrypt using the last secret. Okay, so that's what I'll do. Multiplication goes down one line. Okay, so uh, uh, the way we did this was using this trick called relinearization. And this is a way to convert right quadratic functions of a secret key as linear functions of a possibly different secret key. Uh, this gives us a valuation depth of epsilon log n because of the error. Um, uh, the, 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 the final ciphertext that we get looks exactly like uh, the original ciphertext, right? And the original ciphertext is a product of, uh, is, is a vector and a number, that's, what, that's exactly what the final ciphertext looks like. There's no change in the encryption, uh, decryption complexity, and no change in the ciphertext size as well. Okay? So in fact, uh, this is actually a very generic technique which you can apply not just to the LWE based scheme, but also you know various other schemes, uh, uh, various other lattice-based schemes uh, in the literature. 
Okay, so this is relinearization. Uh, questions? Yes. So going back to the internet search okay. by the server. Yes. Uh, don't you need, in order to apply for the encryption, yes. so don't you need the encryption of the data also? You do need the encryption of, yeah, you do need the encryption of data, but, uh, but that I'm going to say, so I'm the client, you're the server, right? I'm going to encrypt my data, send it to you, and I'm also going to send you this evaluation key, right? So if you have these, you can compute. Um, I mean, uh, doesn't the internet data need No, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. So um, the way I, um, the way I described uh, the scheme is that it takes two encryptions and produces uh, another encryption. You can also take an encryption and a plain text and produce, uh, you know, the functions of uh, of all these guys. So that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is that um, in our scheme, it is easy to compute. I mean, to compute a random encryption, I need to know the secret key, right? Because it's a secret key encryption scheme. But I can compute some encryption of. Uh, it's easy to compute some encryption of a message. Okay. In fact. Um, if you, uh, uh, in our scheme, uh, 0, 0,1 is an encryption of 1, and 0, 0,0 is an encryption of 0. It's some encryption. It's not a secure encryption, but it's some encryption. So what the server can do is can compute this encryption and then operate on, on all encryptions together. OK, sounds good. Um, okay. So the important question is, is this uh, a bootstrappable encryption yet? In the sense that, can I apply the bootstrapping theorem and get a fully homomorphic encryption scheme out of this? Okay. Remember that what uh, we need for this process is that the evaluation depth should be larger than the decryption depth. Okay, that's what we need to apply this theorem. What is the evaluation depth? It's epsilon times log n. Um, the decryption depth, it turns out, is uh, is larger than log. Why is that the case? What is the decryption algorithm? The decryption algorithm is uh, computing a linear function of the secret key, right? So it's simply adding a whole bunch of um, uh, elements in ZQ together and then taking mod 2, okay? It seems such a simple function, right? So why, uh, why is the decryption depth so large? The point is that in the scheme, in its native form, evaluates Boolean circuits, okay? So it computes additional multiplication mod 2, whereas the decryption circuit lives over ZQ, okay, so it computes in a product mod Q. So to apply, uh, to, to run the decryption algorithm homomorphically, which is what the bootstrapping theorem wants, I need to write this mod Q circuit as a mod 2 circuit, and that is tricky, okay. Turns out the best way I know to do this takes a circuit of depth larger than log n. Okay. So I can do epsilon times less than log n, but the decryption uh, circuit has complexity larger than log n. This is, uh, you know, this is the problem. We can't do the bootstrapping theorem anymore. Okay, uh, bootstrap yet? No. Okay, uh, and this is really the, the short blanket syndrome, right? I mean, I can do a little bit, but uh, I mean, I'm always uh, short by, uh, um, uh, I'm always short of the decryption circuit. Okay, so uh, the way, um, okay, so what we want to do is we want to take exactly the scheme that I, that I presented. I want to transform it into another scheme which evaluates the same class of circuits. It can still evaluate epsilon log n uh, depth circuits, but the new scheme will have a smaller, a shallower decryption circuit. Okay, I'm going to transform it to squash uh, the decryption circuit without any additional assumptions. Okay, no, no additional assumptions, I'm going to do uh, uh, this transformation. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the technique of dimension reduction. And really, you know, all of the ingredients that you need to do dimension reduction, you already see. Okay, so the main sort of principle that we will use is the technique that we used in relinearization. You have seen everything that you need to see, we just need to put it together in the right way. Okay, uh, what is uh, what does relinearization allow you to do? It allows you to uh, take linear functions on one secret key and transform it into um, so quadratic functions on one secret key and transform it into a linear function on a new secret key. Right? 
In, in particular, it lets you go from linear functions to linear functions. Very simple, right? The point is that if you look at, if you look closely at this linearization process, it never assumed that the two secret keys, the old secret key and the new secret key, live in the same dimension. That was never a constraint. Okay, they could potentially live in widely differing uh, dimensions. Okay, that's the first observation about this relinearization, relinearization process. Okay, the idea is to use different 